Hello, I'm Tom Butcher of The Zero Project, and I'm here today with Giles Dooley of the Legacy of War Foundation, who is unfortunately, for me, virtual. Giles, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, before Thank you so much. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Don't worry. Um, before we address the issue of building on resilience, perhaps you could just tell us a wee bit about the Legacy of War Foundation, and then we can um, launch ourselves into the three um, points that I, I would like to discuss with you. Absolutely. So the Legacy of War Foundation, um, I set it up, um, must be six years ago now. Um, I'm a photographer. I've covered conflicts for over 20 years. And often when I was telling the stories of the people whose lives I documented, people wanted to support and help. So we started by crowdfunding campaigns and we realized that um, the impact we could have through telling stories and then crowdfunding um, really could change lives. So we started by supporting uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, some of the most vulnerable, mainly those living with long-term disability. We were able to rehouse them and support them. But from that really, the idea for Legacy of War was born, and I wanted to create a foundation, an NGO, that approached things slightly differently. So we really are truly beneficiary-led. We have no international staff. We make sure that all funds raised end up in the hands of uh, the country that we're working in. Um, we have a project, for example, called Land for Women in Rwanda, where we set up cooperative farms, we buy the land, and then it's transferred to the women, so they are the landowners, which changes the power dynamic, meaning they are the ones in control. So really we want to try and reframe the idea of charity and NGOs and how they work and make sure that they are truly beneficiary read, localized, and make sure that the right people will get all the support they need. Great stuff, that's, that's a, a super introduction, thanks so much. So I'm gonna launch into my next point, or the first point, okay. which is, um, could you tell us a little bit please, um, about your own story and how that's really formed your understanding of resilience? Yeah, I mean, I would go back, um, as I say, I, I'm a photographer. Um, at 18, I started working in the worlds of fashion and music, had a very glamorous life, uh, traveling around the world with rock stars. But I always had a sense that I could do something more with my photography, that I could use it uh, for storytelling and advocacy. So in my late 20s, I made the transition from the worlds of, of fashion and rock and roll into working um, in the humanitarian sector. I would say I was not a photojournalist. I was an angry man with a camera. Yep. I believed that these stories could actually create real change. Um, but it was a difficult transition. And, and then sort of six, seven years later, um, I mainly worked in um, South Sudan. I was based in Angola. I was working in DR Congo. But in 2011, I was in Afghanistan. Um, I'm not a war photographer. You'll never see pictures of tanks. You'll never see explosions, soldiers. I'm an anti-war photographer, and my work is all about civilians. And I was there because I felt I wasn't hearing the stories of um, everyday Afghan civilians and how the war there was affecting them. Unfortunately, when I was there in February 2011, I um, also ended up as a victim of war. I stepped on an IED, an improvised explosive device. Yeah. I lost both my legs and my arm. Um, and spent a year in hospital, 37 operations to, to rebuild my life. It's obviously, you know, we'll probably touch on it again, how that built resilience, yeah. but it also gave me a gift, and that was the insight into the stories of the people whose lives I've been documenting already. Quite literally, I had walked in their footsteps. So, yeah, it was a difficult, um, you know, year in hospital, mm. six months learning to walk, but 18 months later, I was back in Afghanistan, working, continuing on the work, and as I say, I think it's made me a better photographer um, and a better man and a better um, storyteller. So, you know, you have to look at these things and you have to see the gifts that are given. Yeah. And one of the mantras that I had when I was in hospital was never focus on the things you can't do, but focus on what you can and yeah. excel at those. And so, yeah, I would say, you know, we're now I think, 11, 12 years after that accident. And, you know, I would say I'm in a better place than ever. And it's, say, given me the insight that's enabled me to set up Legacy of War Foundation and work in ways that I think are totally appropriate because I understand the story better than most. Right, thank you so much. That's, that's a really very good background and I, I, can understand, I can understand a little bit of where you're coming from simply because I spent time up on, in the Northwest Frontier Province in 1986 when <laughs> everything was going on there. And so I, 
have a, a, a wee bit of a, 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 an understanding of it. So let's go on to our next one, and I'd love to return to some of these points if we've got time as well, which is um, how do you see the need to support rehabilitation for those left with disabilities in conflict, especially because I understand you've got a new role at the United Nations. And so if you could tell us, you know, both, both aspects of that would be absolutely great, especially the UN bit. Well, you know, um, the UN role is, is a new role um, and their first um, UN advocate for people injured um, and left with disabilities in conflict and peace building situations. Um, you know, I'm very honored to take on that role. I see that I represent the thousands of people that I've met and, and interviewed and the hundreds of thousands of people who have injuries from conflict and left with long term disability. Um, but I want to actually use a story. You know, I, I said I'm a storyteller. Really, that's my focus. And I was in Cambodia five years ago and I'd gone to a small rehab center um, near Siem Reap. And I met a, a man there who was in his 50s. He had lost both legs um, above the knees. He was a dumbbell, dumbbell amputee. Mm. Now, when you lose your knees as well, it, it makes learning to walk incredibly difficult. Right. Um, the procedures are much more complicated. And he had never really been given the support that he had needed. He'd been injured as a child. Um, he'd actually been fought to, well, forced to fight for the Khmer Rouge. He stepped on a landmine and lost yeah. both his legs. He had literally prosthetics that were virtually handmade. Um, yeah and he could hardly walk on them. Now, he was an incredibly strong-willed man. Uh, we got on, we laughed a lot, we had a really good chat that day, and eventually he invited me to come and visit him the next day where he lived with his sister. When I got there the next day, um, his sister lived in a very humble house. She was struggling to feed her own family. This man was unable to work because of the fact that he'd never been given the right support. Eventually, he showed me on the side of this house there was a little shelter and three large dog baskets. And he pointed at the biggest one and he said, that's my bed. Now, that man was no different to me. We were about the yeah. same age. We have very similar injuries. He was as strong-willed as me, probably more so. He was more determined than me. Yeah. He was probably smarter than me. <laughs> the only difference between him and me was the opportunity for rehabilitation. I always say there is no point saving a life if you don't give somebody their life back. Yeah, yeah. The difference between him and me, I live a full life, I work, I travel. He literally lives like a dog because he did not get the right support. And that's why I've taken on this UN role yeah. because I believe everybody injured in conflict has the right to full support, to get the right um, occupational therapy, um, physiotherapy, prosthetics, whatever is needed to give them a full life. Great. Can you tell us, I mean, I'm really interested about this new role because as you say, it's, it's a new role. And um, yeah. from what I understand, the job just hasn't existed before. So is this a job that um, you are helping to create and that they, those people who follow um, you will take on your mantle and you have to decide what's important or can you tell us a wee bit about it, about the whole creative process? Sure. Yes, so it's, it's something which um, UNMAS, which is the United Nations um, demining organization, um, yes. we worked on the proposal together. Um, as I say, I think it's important to have somebody who is an advocate for people injured in conflict. But more than that, I have 20 years of working with many different organizations and I built up very good relationships yeah. um, over those years. And I think one of the most important things for me is actually about connecting and bringing people together, creating collaborations, not just between the UN organizations, but other large NGOs, and more importantly, the many organizations working within countries. I'm a big believer in supporting civil society within countries. I think too often they're overlooked when big agencies arrive. And so I see my role really as a connector. So really the two yeah. roles are <laughs> storytelling, to yeah. represent those in conflict, yeah. and secondly, to bring people together, maybe bang a few heads together at times, <laughs> um, Get people working together on that simple agenda. Um, and as I say, it's, it makes sense actually for a lot of countries, and it's good to talk to governments as well yeah. about the economic impact of getting people back to work. You know, rehabilitation is often seen as expensive. It can obviously be very long term. But the reality is this helps get people back to work, yeah. which means actually in the long term it helps economies.
Great. Thank you so much. I see that we've got five minutes left. So I'm going to go on to our third point, which you touched yep. on a wee bit at the beginning. And it's, for me, it's a really interesting one. So could you please, I'm not going to ask you to touch upon, could you please tell me and us about your Land for Women project in Rwanda, which for me is quite obviously a really positive outcome of building on resilience. Yeah, I mean, let me touch, maybe the resilience thing I'll touch on very briefly first. Yeah, yes, please. I spent a year in hospital. I spent 46 days where I could only communicate with the world by blinking when I was in intensive care. 46 days I yep. thought would be the last of my life. Um, in fact, twice my family was calling to say their goodbyes and all I could do was blink back at them. I then spent, as I say, another year learning to walk again. I was told I'd never walk. Um, you know, it really was a battle. And so when uh, actually COVID began, a lot of people got in contact with me, businesses and individuals, and they said, Giles, could you come and talk to us because we need to be more resilient? Yeah. And actually my answer surprised them because I said, you can't make yourself more resilient in my belief. And they'd be like, well, I've seen a book and there's a podcast and surely yeah. we can. My reply was, I believe resilience is life's gift for suffering. When you right. go through difficult times, Resilience is the outcome. It's like we stretch the elasticity of our mind through difficult times, like an athlete in training. Yeah. The outcome is the reward. And so my belief is that I have been given the gift of resilience. And it's one of the things that I relate to with the stories and the people that I document. And it's one of the most underused resources in people. Right. So Land for Women was set up when I met Olive, who is a genocide survivor and one of the most resilient and wonderful people I know. Uh, we built up a very good friendship. Yeah. She had a cooperative and they grew uh, potatoes. Yeah. But they received no money, they had to rent the land. And again, I'm going to use another word, I just use resilience. Yeah. Um, another word is empowerment. Yes. Now, I hear a lot of NGOs say that we empower people around the world. We empower women, we empower communities. Yeah. Again, I would say that is nonsense. You can't empower someone else. Yeah. I realized that when I was in hospital, nobody empowered me to walk. They supported me. I had the yeah. most amazing network of friends and family, of doctors, medics, yeah. nurses. But I had to empower myself. And I realized it was the same for Olive and the women in Rwanda that we worked with, yeah. that I couldn't empower them. Yeah. My job was to break down the barriers that were stopping them empowering themselves yeah. and allow them to use their resilience and flourish. Yeah. And so that's why Land for Women works like that. We buy the land. Yes. It's a five-year training program that covers everything from cultural smart, sorry, um, climate smart farming yeah. to banking. Yeah. And we don't even say that we give them the land. We return the land right. to the women. Yeah. So once those barriers are broken down, now most NGOs, there's a power dynamic and quite often between a Western NGO and people that they're supporting. We've changed that power dynamic because now they are the landowners. They yeah. choose to... Yeah. So, that, for me, is truly allowing people to empower themselves by breaking down those barriers. Great. Thank, Thank you so much, Giles. I, I think I've only got about 30 seconds left. So what I would suggest is that anybody who's interested in learning about Giles' story goes to Giles' website and the website of the organisation. Can you give it to everybody very quickly, please? Absolutely. Legacyofwarfoundation.com. Wonderful. Giles, thank you so much. I wish I could speak more. I would love to speak more about, um, if you didn't mind, about northern Pakistan and Afghanistan, but another time. In the meantime, time. thank you so much, and thank you so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. My Bye. pleasure. Bye. OK. Thank you so much. It's always such fun. Yeah. It's always such fun. Hello. Yeah. I thank you so much. So I've got quite a few tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I've got some ones in the morning. Thank you, gentlemen. So see you tomorrow. Yeah.